Hi, welcome to the Sifu Mimi Chan Show. Thanks for joining the conversation. Hello, hello, Hoon. Thank you so much for joining me on my podcast again. Thanks for having me back. Appreciate it. Oh, my gosh. Well, we've actually been playing, I don't know, podcast tag. Is that what it's called? Yeah, yeah. Our calendar tag, I guess. Or or um, how to maintain contact without actually ever really engaging. That seems to be, <laughs> seems to be what happens it's... in your 40s, for me at least. It's just wandering around never quite realizing that you can't meet up with anybody that's right the wandering monk right yeah, um exactly you, no but you know what it is it's that uh i it, there's kind of an ongoing joke with why i have this podcast it's so that i can actually talk to people i like to talk to it's very <laughs> selfish really <laughs> I think that's a genius idea. I should do that. I should try that. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, you could, you, I, and then it ends up being like everyone becomes a co host of the show because I just keep having <laughs> the same people that I, that I want to talk to again back on. And I'm like, oh, it's time to talk to Hoon again. And yeah, yeah so yeah. here we are. <laughs> <laughs> that that works for you. That that works for me. It's all good. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I'm always grateful that you, uh, you know, make time in your schedule for me. I know you've been traveling and and filming and doing all sorts of things. A lot of things I want to talk to you about. Um, sure. But I know you were asking me like I've been busy, and it's like you've yes, been I really have. busy. I've been <laughs> I've been uh, you know watching from afar via social media, and your your education legislation had just went through. Congratulations! Thank you so much. You're actually like the first human I've spoken to, so I'm still really excited wow. to talk about it. <laughs> yeah, please do, please. I, no, uh, so I really that actually, hear about it. I know by the time it, this airs, it would have been maybe a couple weeks, but literally this happened last night, so. Uh, of course, I talked to my team until like midnight on Zoom and I haven't slept right. in like two or three days. So uh, I'm not <laughs> sure. Uh, podcast listeners disclaimer what is going to come out of my mouth. Right. This, this is going to be an all timer. <laughs> this one. This one's going to be one for the yes, books. Exactly. One for the books. So uh, it's very exciting. It's it's um, an interesting time in Florida. Uh, I'm not going to pull punches now since my legislation passed, and I'll make sure I release this after the governor officially signs right. the bill. Right. Um, but yeah, it's been a fucking shit show here in Florida. I'm yeah. not going to lie. <laughs> it's yeah. been it's been pretty crazy. And so the irony is that when I tell people, oh, yeah, I'm I'm working on education in Florida, people have actually laughed at me. Now, as your as your co-host, can you yes. can you please can you walk us through what the specifics of the legislation are? What were the things that you were actually advocating for in this? <laughs> oh, I love this. This is horrible. I'm gonna have to have you back on. I feel like you're interviewing <laughs> me now. <laughs> Woo! Oh, that was such a switch. Um, right. So this started two years ago, and it feels like it's been five. I actually had yeah. legislators tell me, "Well, I've been working with you on this bill for four, three or four years," and I'm like, "It's been two, but yeah, it feels that long." So. Uh, after the Atlanta spa shooting, I got pretty irate like the rest of us. Mm -hmm. And I'm very much restless until I put my energy into action. And right. upon researching education, education, education was like one of the biggest things that is always brought up as the solution to long term solution for, you know, anti Asian hate crimes or any mm -hmm. any violence, any hate. Right. And I just thought about it and said, wow, you know, I learned zero about Asian American history right. in school. I was Florida educated. I went here, you know, grew up public school and private school educated, also um, went to college here. And I was like, wow, I, I know nothing. And so upon that, I know nothing. I went to kind of seek out what's next. I started a petition. I got a bill sponsor randomly that just kind of happened. I learned the first year what legislation was like and how difficult politics are. And um, when they say, oh, it's all politics, I, I get what that really means now. And then this year, I learned from my mistakes. I went with a very specific strategy to get this done. And I can't believe it, but it's it's kind of done. <laughs> so yeah, that's amazing. That's, that's so a really short version of the last two years of my life, which has been all consuming. It, it's like so, a full-time job. So let me job. ask, as, as someone from the outside, yeah. how did you even go about you know, it seems like there's an incredible amount of inertia that I think all, all of us really experience. And it's very easy to settle into this trap of feeling like um, I can't do anything. I'm one person. Yeah. Um, this machine is too large. I don't even understand this machine. I don't even know if it is a machine. Right. And yeah. And uh, so how did you go about just getting 
you know, that first toehold that allowed you to push forward? Yeah, I think there was um, what we call luck and timing involved, but okay. I'm such a martial artist in the whole hard work equals results type of mm. mentality. And that's just literally been beaten and ingrained into me, right? Uh, from a traditional standpoint. But I, I, so like I said, I, I went into action and because through my Kung Fu, you know, organization with Walam, we do a lot of, you know, community outreach. We do all, we started the Lunar New Year celebrations here in Orlando in 1980, mm -hmm. right? Like, so we've been doing mm -hmm. this for over 40 plus years. And so through that, I've met legislators, they go to the, the parades right. and everything. Right. And so I kind of reached out to, um, and through this podcast, I actually had some of them on the show to mm -hmm. reach out to, you know, hear what the issues are. And so I ended up reaching out to a local legislator and saying, like, what do I do? How does this get done? And she literally, and this is um, Rep Representative Eskamani here in Orlando, was like, I want to write this bill with you. And I said, oh, OK. And I didn't even realize that in itself was like a huge jump. Right. I didn't mm -hmm. understand that getting a bill written is not a one, you know, a, a very common thing because um, here in Florida, anyway, legislators only have a certain number they're allowed to write. So the reps right. only I allowed see. seven. So they've already right. probably promised a lot of things from the year before, et cetera, et cetera. So that's kind of how that got started. Um, it ended up being not successful in that round for a plethora of reasons. Um, mm -hmm. But one of which is we are in a super majority here which is a, a Republican state. And so mm -hmm. I needed to get a Republican on board and also work with the Republicans to let them see why this was important. So I literally right. had to hit the pavement. I had to go to Tallahassee several times during the session. I had to have very uncomfortable conversations uh, with people that maybe I don't align with on other issues and learn how to compartmentalize. Big challenge and meditation for me sure. there. But it was, right. yeah, it, so it was such a process. And when people ask, how can it be done? If they want to get it done in their states, my answer will be go to Make Us Visible. You can you can learn all about advocacy there. And, you know, I got connected with a really great uh, team, a small but mighty team that really helped with guidance because they were getting this passed in other states. But mm. Florida was a very, we're a special state. <laughs> I'm sure, you, I mean, I don't I know other states that are on the news as much as we are, right? I mean, I mean, what do you guys see it, looking in? But, like you guys no, but are that's watching. The thing. We, I think I think it's it's um you know, it's pretty accepted now to use sort sort of Florida as a as a bit of a punchline. Right. But I also think it's a little, you know, it it really feels like it's also a little bit of a crucible. And we're starting to understand it's a way, I think, for people to uh maybe use a, a not so fair shorthand I, I will say to examine larger issues in the country you know it's a yeah. it's a sort of i don't know like a gestural lens that we we just kind of use um mm -hmm. but so you went through this whole process and you said the first year it was a little bit of a swing and a miss and then mm -hmm. the second year, what were the ways you adjusted your strategy in order to? <laughs> oh wow, you really are success. conducting this interview. I'm going to give you five <laughs> more minutes. <laughs> but you no, know, I'm it's... really, I'm really personally curious, and I think it's hugely important. Yes, thank you for that. No, I mean, if I could have anyone interviewing me, I mean, Hoon Lee, wow, this is actually really great because <laughs> and, and you just caught me at timing. Like literally, this happened last night, so I'm still like on the high, yeah. I haven't slept. So I'm like, whatever good, you want to talk good. about, let's no, do good. it. Yeah. yeah. So, um. In all honesty, we did get a lot down in year one of of building. So we right. made relationships, we talked to people, but there was a lot of resistance. Um, uh, one was having a Democratic sponsor was already a, a resistance mm -hmm. um, issue. And then the second was, oh, we're, we're focusing on these things, right? And so right. we also ran out of time. It was towards the end of the right. COVID bit where the house was closed. You couldn't even go to Tallahassee yet. And then right I when see. it opened, it was kind of like we were already behind. It was too late to hit the pavement, as they say here in the biz, uh, which means you basically go and run up and down the Capitol trying to talk mm -hmm. to as many people in an elevator on the stairwell as they're coming out of their meetings. Like it's literally like talk and go. Uh, wow. It's it's kind of what you see on TV. Yeah. Where it's like, OK, let me catch this person. It's like you're a little bit of a stalker, to be honest. Right. And you go right. down and you try to get the key players and you have to learn all of that. Right. Um, so last year we did well with community outreach, meaning we had this across the state of Florida, all of the different orgs kind of were aware of who we were. We had mm. a lot of constituents calling the representatives for the first time. I think AAPI engagement in civics like this is pretty low, generally speaking. And they all yes. really rallied behind this because as you and I know, Asian Americans are not a monolith. We're also not all from the same background. We don't have the mm -hmm. same political views. We don't have the same religious views. It's very 
wide. Yes. But this was something almost, I mean, we really didn't have very many people go, oh, it's a horrible idea. Why do we want to learn about Asian American history? Like everybody was really behind this. And so I thought, wow, there's something we can all work on together despite other beliefs. This is like it's some sort yeah. of utopia like moment in my time that I, I kind of mm -hmm. needed right through all this negativity and being somewhere in Florida where everything around you just feels like it's crashing down. I really needed that. And so hmm. the swing in the miss was there, but we still got through one committee, which again is like, oh my gosh, you even got it on agenda for a committee. That's huge. Um, so we, we still did pretty good. And I think it's just because it's like anything else in your business, in martial arts and everything. It's about relationships, right? It's about sitting right. down and having honest conversations with people and even though the legislatures can be portrayed a certain way, and a lot of them are, but they're still just people. You yeah. know, they they have regular jobs they actually go back to. They're like realtors right. or right. doctors, and they're not, you know, they're not these like, you know, up here on this pedestal. I think you just have conversations and mm -hmm. share why this is meaningful and what, what this means for the community. I think, you know, because the AAPI vote here, it's there, but we're not like the majority, right? So right. it had to be something that, they did also had to buy into at least a bit, right? And so right. this year, I I regrouped and I basically hit the ground running and I said, okay, I'm going to go after um, getting the right sponsor, not just a Republican, but someone who I thought would believe in the bill, would help push mm -hmm. for it. Because you could get a sponsor that also just like doesn't talk to anyone about it or anything like that. And just to give you a quick statistic, I think here in Florida this year, this session, less than 3% of bills that are written pass. It's right. a very low number. And apparently that's still high. Like that's every year. That's not just because it's this year. So it's a really t difficult thing. And we met people that they've been like doing this for 12 years straight and still haven't gotten their bill passed. So right. we're very fortunate. But their bill's crazy. Their bill's yeah. insane. That's a problem. <laughs> you know, so I, they're you like, know, it, it's like just... free cotton candy every Friday. Yeah. yeah. Every... <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so, yeah, it's, it's just such a process. And it just takes a lot of persistence and and conversations, really, at the end of the day. And and someone who is crazy enough to uh, do the work and take time out of their life and just like just just shoulder it, right? And um, had a really great volunteer team as well. You know, different people rotating in and out over the last couple of years, but it's been inspiring. We had children. We had a sixth grader come to the the Capitol to testify on behalf mm -hmm. of the bill, which is really exciting. We had high schoolers and middle schoolers engaged and. Um, yeah, so it's been really, it's been really crazy, but like, like I said, you caught me on a real high, you know, you 15 should minutes in. <laughs> this is phenomenal. And also, uh, just listening to all of it, I'm exhausted. So I can't imagine how tired you must be. Thank you. Um, but I actually, I was uh, talking about your process to a friend of mine here because yeah. she is encountering a situation where she is sort of, um, wrestling with a, a certain uh, process in the educational system for her son here, mm. who is a special needs child. Yeah, and um, you know, I think that it's really important to have examples of people that have sort of said, "Look, I feel strongly about something, and I need to make a change about it." And to understand yeah. that that can actually happen, mm -hmm. that it may not be easy, but that the participation yeah. in our democracy is something that is literally at our doorstep should we choose to engage with it. And I think that's an incredibly important thing to hear, and. I mean, it really hats off. I think it's Thank I you. think it's an incredible achievement. Well done. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Yeah. I I I agree because I think it becomes an overwhelming entity that's like, oh, I wouldn't be able to do that. And I will tell everyone, I know nothing about legislation. I mean, I do now, mm -hmm. but I knew nothing, like zero. I didn't even know how a bill became a law. By the mm -hmm. way, schoolhouse rock lies. It yeah. there, there are no rules. Okay. The rule is there are no rules. A bill right. dies, it's not dead. Because our bill was in, in a lot of trouble and I had to go to Tallahassee to save it. Like literally had to go there to save it. Mm -hmm. I, it it's like this, almost like a physical thing, right? And so, um, yeah, so it's really empowering, I think, to know as constituents and to be reminded that they work for us and that they need to listen to us. And that if we are willing to raise our voices, then we can get this done, right? And so just like an everyday human like myself, I didn't have a huge, you know, corporate lobbying firm with mm -hmm. millions of dollars backing me to go, you know, a lawyer to go talk to everybody. You know, I had some really great helpers that were on the ground, but literally like 
anyone can do it if they're willing to do the work, you know? Now and, my, and that, my understanding, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I no, no, I'm off, just sorry. saying that that holds true for, for almost anything. If you're willing to do the work, you can get it done, right? Now, my understanding is uh, based on your posts that it, it passed pretty clearly, like there wasn't a huge amount of opposition. Is that correct? Yeah. So we passed unanimously through every single committee we were in. Um, we also passed unanimously through the House and the Senate when it was um, like our bill. And mm. then what happened was because of time, the Senate, we got held up. So we had to get amended onto another bill. This was how okay, we saved gotcha. the bill. So the language right. is still there. And it doesn't matter to me what bill number it is. We got really lucky there where we not only got amended to like the education package of the mm. year, um, which meant like already vetted by Department of Education and the governor. Mm -hmm. And so there's not going to be opposition. It's also, to me, one of the bills where I also didn't feel like, wow, we're being attached to something that I'm really depressed about. Like I feel in yeah, opposition yeah, yeah. with like one of the things one of the legislators said during the session was, um, you know, perfect can also be the enemy of good. So it's right. like, obviously, there's no perfect thing, but I Man, we got real lucky with the bill that we got attached to where it was very technical. It was very much about education um, and it was a bipartisan supported effort, which is pretty awesome. So, yeah, it's I hear exciting. that phrase a lot in, in with regards to politics. Don't let yes. perfect be the enemy of, the, of good. And I yeah. often want to go, are you sure we achieved good? <laughs> yes. You know what I mean? It's like, I don't think 100%. anyone's standing for perfect. Right. So let's settle down with that 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 little saying. I, I yes. was like, look, I don't think anyone's under any illusions about perfect. We're yes. looking for yes. good. And this yes. this thing you're proposing is bad. Yes. You know no, I mean? 100%. And, There's a lot of yeah. bad. I mean, There's and a lot, a lot of, of bad. bad coming out of Florida. I had to sit through some very, very painful committee hearings. Yeah. You know, we have the, the Don't Say Gay 2.0. We have the transgender bathroom bans. We have yes. the six week abortion ban. We, I mean, I had to sit through some really painful things personally to me and compartmentalize yeah. and go, I am here for this one mission at this particular point in time, because it's kind of the, do you take everything on and then get nothing done because you're being pulled? Or do you just do like chip away and do one focused thing at a time? And again, back to martial arts for me, that's like one thing at a time. Yeah. All right. I think I've given you enough time. <laughs> 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 to be on the Thank you. On thanks the, for indulging me on, on that. The, uh, <laughs> I, I've, I've, I've been dying to talk to you about it. So I think I really more so. My it. listeners are like, shut up. Talk to <laughs> me about Warrior and Writers <laughs> no, 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 no. Guild and acting and, and no, way no, no, more no. interesting. Way <laughs> more. Like this is way more important. Way more interesting. Way more <laughs> yeah. important. Way more like, interesting. We're not here to talk about legislation. Well, we were talking and kind of chuckling a little off air because I was like, well, you you know, you advocate. You definitely speak out when when things are wrong. And and so, I mean, no, everyone there are has levels. their own way. There are levels. <laughs> well, we there all we levels. were both talking about Perry, our, our dear yeah. friend Perry Young. And I don't know if you remember or recall, but like I happened to be in New York. We met up for tea and then we met an activist that, you know, he knew. And then I kind of like he knew my mm. dad from Boston. And then we ended up at a, a, a rally the next day together. Like, of sure, course, naturally. I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's always the thing that happens. If you, if you meet up with Perry in New York, you, you might end up at a rally. Just uh, be warned, anybody. Yeah, who so that that so that him. tracks, which means he's at them very often. <laughs> he is, he is, yes. and he's such a good, he's such a great representative. Amazing. Um, he feels so passionately about it, Amazing. and he, uh, you know, you know, it is a danger with these sorts of things where, um, you know, it can we can turn anything into a competition, and I think it's really important for people to simply do the thing that they can do. You know, yeah. the thing you feel equipped to do, 100%. do that thing. It might be. Uh, it might be something you consider to be small, but it's certainly better than nothing. And it's the sort of thing that in aggregate can make a significant difference. One thing I, I just, I'm, I'll get off this topic uh, at, at your request. I could talk about it all day, but I, I, one thing I do want to point out as a sort of um, like uh, something that I think is really interesting about what you're talking about, as, as much as you talk about compartmentalizing what you have to deal with in order to deal with, you know, uh, potential allies that you might need. I think it's really important to also recognize that those people that might hold these beliefs that we don't agree with or are pushing forth policies that we see as absolutely draconian, they also have the ability to, to get a win somewhere else, that they see some value in something, that they aren't going to obstruct something that, that um, 
is in alignment with something that we need. I think that that's actually really important to recognize because we don't, we're never going to be eye to eye on everything. Yeah. We just have to try to make the things work, you know? Yeah. And um, so I think I find that very, very hopeful that you could, you know, come to the table with people that are ostensibly, you know, opposition yeah. and, and recognize that in those people, there are fragments of them or, or aspects of them that are, that are in fact allied or can be allied. And that's yeah. something I think we, we lose, we lose sight of that so easily day to day. No, hundred yeah. percent. And I'm actually really glad you shared what you just did regarding like advocacy or volunteerism or however you want to state it, just having those bite-sized actions that whatever is, you know, um, reasonable for you. Like, it doesn't mean you have to take on this big thing. Like I'm a little extra, yeah. right. Uh, but, but yeah, just making one phone call, like those things do add up and they make a difference, but yeah. you're right. Because what we see on the news, those humans we see aren't the humans that I actually saw in the hallways no. that all no. work and like laugh together, have lunch together am amicably. Mm -hmm. I'm like, Oh, we make it be, I thought they would be enemies that like, they all sit on Look, each other. The opposite actors ends know of when acting is happening. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes. Yes. yes right, actors 100%. can recognize actors. Yes. Yeah. So it's I think that was refreshing. Yeah. I think it was, like you said, hopeful and refreshing to yeah. know, like, no, you know what? They are human. And, yeah. and there, there was some genuine and sincere conversations with people that I disagree on almost everything else with. And that is, that yeah. is a hopeful thing. And so if I've learned anything that I think, um, being able to to hold those conversations, I think, has been healthy. Uh, but I'm definitely ready to step away from it. <laughs> Take <Yeah>. a moment. <laughs> no, well, well, congratulations again. Thank so. you so much. I, I'm very grateful that you and I are able to share this conversation this morning. I'm like, oh man, I don't know what I'm going to be like at 10 o'clock after this <laughs> crazy evening I just had and all this news and, and, and excitement. But I have been wanting to talk to you about so many things. Obviously, sure. you know, the Warrior uh, trailer dropped. Everybody's super psyched about that. And not only, uh, I don't know if it's big secrets, but we talked about it last time that, you know, you're mm. writing and also yeah. acting and doing so many different aspects of that. Now, uh, what was the, what was that like for you to have kind of a different experience this time around? And uh, You know, every season tends to have its own character. So enough. In a season one of a show, you are you're often just trying to figure out what the hell's going on, and you're getting used to the flow of the production. Everyone is trying to solve that equation all at the same time in real time, and so uh, in the worst iterations of in the worst incarnations of that, it can feel very chaotic, right? But in the best incarnations of it, it's it's absolutely thrilling, and it's the sort of thing that creates. Um, a lot of camaraderie and a sort of glue amongst the crew, which fortunately for us is, is what happened. Mm -hmm. um, and then second season, you're like, okay, I kind of understand what's going on and you can start to uh, shift your attention somewhat and start to evolve certain things. You've learned stuff from season one, you've, you know, seen your own work for better or for worse. And you've been like, I'm going to change everything about how I do everything. Or you're like, okay, I need to make little tweaks or whatever it might be. And then um, I think season three for shows is often where, you know, a lot of shows really hit their stride because they are, um, you know, you know, the process, you, you have the experience, but you're still in the, you're still discovering things. You're, it's still fresh. It's still, you haven't fallen into a lot of bad habits yet still. Um, and then I think the challenge from that, that point going forward is to not get too comfortable and to not uh, became, become too settled in the things that you think are successful and to remember that taking risk is, is part of what keeps something fresh and exciting and, and vibrant, you know? So we had this sort of, I, I do think of it as a disadvantage and an advantage. One, the disadvantage was we had this massive, you know, interval of time yeah. caused not just by the, you know, worldwide crises that everyone was going through, but also by these much more mundane sort of um, uh, machinations created by these mergers and, you know, Cinemax and HBO becoming part of Time Warner. And then there was yeah. another merger when we came out. And those things just create a lot of uncertainty internally. And so you end up in a place where you're just kind of floating in limbo. We didn't know what the status of the show would be, et cetera. So by the time we came back, it had been three years. And, you know, you can think about 
you know, you think about how different a person is in the course of three years, let alone in the wake of pandemic, et cetera, all this political upheaval. And so when we came back to Cape Town, we were not only dealing with uh, the baggage we were bringing, either from the US or the UK or Canada, et cetera, um, but we were also dealing with how Cape Town was was dealing with the after, aftermath of that as well. And they had a very aggressive uh, lockdown, you yes. know, like yeah. when we heard about it, we were like, that's intense, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and so things were opening up, but they were still figuring things out as well. All of which is to say, things were very different in season three. Um, and we had to, it, it had somewhat of a similar vibe as a season one, where you have to relearn processes, you have to sort of understand your mechanisms again. And I think that there's a benefit to that as well. Like, because of that interval of time, uh, I think it would have been challenging for us to come back in full stride anyway. So to have more of the system sort of feel different and something we had to really engage with and pay attention to, I think it really helped bring our A game up. Like we really had to dig in and, and sort of like find our way through this. Yeah. And I think that that's really going to pay off. Um, that made it a hard season, but it was buoyed up by this incredible drive and desire, I think for the cast and crew to come back with, you know, not having, not only not having missed a step, but to elevate it despite the, the uh, obstacles to yeah. that process, to try Absolutely. to keep doing that. Um, yeah, so for me personally, it was compounded by the, the sort of additional aspect of being a writer on the show and yeah. not knowing what that process was going to feel like and not understanding how that would play out or manifest itself in the course of the season. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was really, I mean, I could not have asked for a better sort of result or process through it. Um, Jonathan Tropper, who was our co-creator and our showrunner for season one and two, he uh, handed the reins off to Evan Endicott and Josh Stoddard, who have been with us since the beginning. And they're amazing guys. They have, um, you know, just vast, vast wells of uh, intellectual and emotional resources to draw from. They they have the trust of the cast and crew. Um, So it was a wonderful team to, to transition to. Yeah. Um, and Jonathan's presence was still felt, you know, Brad Kane's presence was still felt. They helped, you know, in, uh, obviously, uh, in the creation of the season and the breaking of all the story, right. you know, Jonathan was still very much at the helm at that point. And I think that, um, for me coming in, it was as, as hospitable an environment as I really could have hoped for. Yeah. Um, the part I was concerned about was I wasn't sure how I would feel watching scenes that I had written performed by these actors. I, I knew I would be excited because I was excited in the writing of it. Um, right. I do feel like as an actor, it's as part of the cast, I mean, you know, you get to know the cast in a, in a different way than producers right. do or writers do. And so I felt like uh, I felt like I might have a somewhat unique insight into what they were capable of and mm-hmm. sort of the things that I think they could do well. And oftentimes, if someone's very good in their job, any job, I think, uh, you know, that that aspect of their personality or their skills get, skill set gets emphasized. And then the other parts are somewhat, you know, somewhat, you know, just disregarded a bit, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um I think any actor that's, you know, worth their salt, they're capable of a huge array of things. Um, And weirdly, I think often the better you are in in some direction, the more they want to, you know, that's typecasting really, the more they want to just sort of keep that very, very tightly focused. Um, So in the ways that I was able to, these aren't dramatic seismic ways by any stretch, but in the ways that I was able to, my hope was to be able to to allow my friends and colleagues to to pull a little bit stretch a little bit um outside of the things that they just do naturally so well and uh my secret fear was that i would i had seen these scenes so clearly in my head and my fear was that i would 
get to set on the day and then they would perform it and I would feel terrible about it and be like, no, 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 that's completely wrong. And like, get really, <laughs> it's not my vision. Get really controlling and, and um, <laughs> weird about it. And then like, you know, and then ruin all my friendships and, you know, um, <laughs> thanks. But I was, yeah, exactly. Like that was like, You're like yeah, this Langley, could, I uh, wrote you something real be good bad. in this scene. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Because um, I can imagine that would be fun. I mean, it would be kind of, would have been kind of fun if you gave him like a fake page. I mean, like, yeah, I wrote you this special yeah. like, soliloquy uh, at the beginning. Apparently, I think, um, what is it? I think it was the cast of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Okay. I think for one April Fool's Day, they gave Danny DeVito a fake script, like a fully written <laughs> fake script in which his character is just like beaten relentlessly through the whole <laughs> Like... <laughs> It's actually, it's a hilarious prank. Um, yeah. But. You didn't do uh, it. Missed opportunity. No, no, no. Oh my gosh. Four. There was no time. There was no time for any tomfoolery. <laughs> oh, no, we had a lot to do. There's always time. Um, <laughs> but we, when I actually ended up on set on the day and ended up shooting, I was so uh, relieved and pleased that um, everyone did it exactly the way I want. No, I'm just kidding. They, <laughs> everyone Everyone did it completely differently from how I had seen it. But oh. that is what felt correct. Okay. Like when I saw the performance unfolding, I was like, oh, that's actually right. And the thing I was doing, it, it really is a blueprint, you know? Yeah. And they made it something that was better than what I felt was on the page. It was such an exhilarating feeling. And I wasn't sure... Uh, how I was going to feel about it. And so I was hugely encouraged by that. And I, it, nice. it gave me a level of, of sort of joy in the process that I, that feels different. Um, and relief. Relief somewhat, but the, really okay. the relief came, there was definitely some relief, but yeah, that was from the performance aspect. Like I, I trust my cast. It wasn't ever. Right, about, right, right. It, it was more about my reaction. Like what okay. would my reaction be this terrible you know, ogre like reaction. Um, but I it was, that, it but. really was the opposite. <laughs> yeah. um, it really felt incredible to, to witness it. And it felt like a privilege. And, uh, the other fear that I really harbored was that the writing team, Jonathan cast and crew would just be like, Hey man, nice try. <laughs> <laughs> really like good pat effort you on the on the shoulder yeah or, you know because oh, everyone's very everyone's very kind you know yes yeah <laughs> they're not afraid to uh speak to you frankly if, if it's right, required right. but they're kind they're kind yeah. people yeah. and so no one was going to come to me and be like deliberately trying to tear me down for no legitimate right. reason but you would be able to tell if people were <laughs> you know if they thought it wasn't so good and they well, they're good actors on screen, but <laughs> oh, but everybody, you know, the writers yeah. and Jonathan yes, and everything. Yes, so to have uh, to feel that I was supported, to feel that yeah. people were were pleased with what came out, um, and to feel that the actors who I already knew were going to do everything in their power to support me in terms of their preparation and their commitment, um, which was absolutely the case, to feel that they felt the material was was good. Um, was it, that was the biggest relief. That was the thing that where I was like, okay, cool. Um, <laughs> nice. Yeah. I, I, you guys all have such an interesting like family dynamic and having had the privilege of speaking with a lot of different um, creatives and mm. actors, writers, et cetera, on different shows and just the different experiences. And they're not all like this one. And you, no. You know, when you say you're writing for your friends and you're writing for people that you know well, they're and and you're saying, oh well, they did it different than I had in my head. But I think, like mm -hmm. you said, you really know them so well that that blueprint was there, and and like the interpretation may be slightly different. But I think you knowing them probably made it even more, you know, incredible and in, like the depth of it and everything. So because you guys really have a very unique I, dynamic, I, I think the warrior family. I think that where it really came into play, because I, what's surprising is some, not surprising, I, I guess, but one thing that can happen is that even if someone knows you very well and that you know they have your best interest at heart, sometimes you're surprised by, you know, the way they view you, okay. right? And and that way, it may not be an unflattering way, but it may be a somewhat limiting way, mm. right? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And I think that what the, the real advantage for me was there's a lot of trust. So I think that um, if people encountered things in the script that I wrote that they, they had questions about or that, you know, made them tilt their head or they just, that bumped for them or whatever it might be, they were willing to give me the benefit of the, of the doubt so that we could have a conversation and start to address what that thing is. Um, and, you know, that might not have been the case if it was a writer they had no familiarity with or a director they didn't right. really know. It might be more of a sense of like, um, I'm not sure where this person is going and I want to make sure the integrity of what I built is, is maintained, mm -hmm. which I think is totally legitimate and fair. Um, but I didn't feel that at all. I felt that people were sort of like, they were game, you know, they were going to yeah. just try and, if, and, and they were going to give me the benefit of the doubt at every turn. Um, that was a tremendous blessing. And, uh, I, I don't know that I would have, I'm not sure I would have pursued this path in another show. Uh, um, okay. Just because I think that not only because I was so excited to write for this specific show, but because the environment was pretty much as hospitable as it was going to get. Um, so now that I've sort of broken the seal on it, I feel like, like the world is opened up in that nice. way. Um, but, you know, it, it, I owe a lot to this production and the people involved because I don't know that I would have felt comfortable crossing that threshold otherwise. Nice. Yeah. And it's funny because you always hear about the writer's room and yeah. what, you know, and is it like what we all imagine where you're all sitting around and brainstorming and then you go back and write and you bring pages in or, I mean, I, I have the one experience. I, I could not <laughs> speak to anything else. Um, one thing I will say is a very sharp group of people. Um, there were some things I was really pleased about to be able to, come out of the room and relay to the cast, which okay. was sort of like, you know, in, in a, I don't know that this happened a lot or happens a lot in our show, but it's not an atypical thing where a, a cast can grow a little bit paranoid about the motivations of producers and writers. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. and you start going, Oh, this is the thing that they're trying to do. Or, you know, um, this is the agenda they're trying to push. And I don't know that I fully agree with it or what have you. Um, and we have very little of that in general. Um, and I would, I would argue that a lot of whatever does exist on that level is easily chalked up to fatigue. Um, mm -hmm. just flat out fatigue. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which I think can be very deep seated for certain members of the cast because of their physical exertion on the show and the, the, uh, the demands placed on them. And even then it's incredibly mild when I've heard it and few and far between, but I was very pleased to be able to kind of come back to the cast and say, everyone is as they appear to be that they, that there's, there isn't this sort of, um, secret dialogue going on that right. is like Conspiracy. incredibly nefarious and, and, yeah. you know, and that people are just talking shit about people behind closed yeah. doors and that also people's involvement, their investment and their, the sense of importance of the show is genuine um, and that they feel it in their bones because the reality is, you know, as an Asian American performer and with a cast that is largely of Asian descent, you know, we feel it a certain way and it would be really tragic if leadership also did not feel invested, you know, if, or if they, or if they didn't recognize that we felt so invested or they assumed that their investment was e like, or equivalent to ours, you know what right, I mean? Like, right. but there was an awareness of all of those things. And, you know, I, I love that and that they love the actors that they, they were excited that to, to, to craft plot that would, you know, challenge the actor or challenge the character or lead to a great hero moment or lead to a great tragic moment, whatever. Um, I don't think that, that those things are uncommon amongst writers, don't get me wrong, but mm -hmm. it's one thing to assume those things and it's another thing to see it firsthand. Yeah. And then to kind of come back to the community of actors and be like, you know, I've been over the hill and, <laughs> you know, it's like I've seen, I've seen it. Yeah, I've seen I've it seen firsthand. It. <laughs> it exists. Um, <laughs> And that's really great. Like that was a yeah. huge, like that made me feel incredibly good about the production I already felt really good about. Um, yeah. 
so sure. much fun. I I mean, obviously, when the trailer dropped, everybody was super excited because it was long awaited. And the last time you and I spoke, I'm trying to okay, so I've, I've been very fortunate. You and I have spoke off air a couple of times. You were kind of right. to like give me advice, things like that, and just like take my phone calls. But uh, you and I spoke and it was just a lot's changed for um, Asians and Asian Americans in mm. cinema and TV and film. And so Warrior was just like trying to almost like in that breakthrough moment still, like we were still fighting for this show <laughs> that had a mostly, you know, Asian descent cast and um now we've got a, a film that just won the oscar much of the cast just won the oscars and you know netflix has been throwing out a bunch of shows with aapi leads and asian asian leads and i, I mean it's it's kind of crazy because we're always like oh there's still much more work to be done there's still a long way to go but at the same time it feels like just since the last time you and i spoke like things are very different in terms of the landscape for um, actors who are of Asian descent. Would you? I, I think or? that that's always thoughts? dependent on the time scale, mm. right? Um, because, you know, I'm certainly old enough to remember moments that felt like this in the past. Okay. You know, so there was, you know, Joy Luck Club, Miss Icon, yes. All American Girl, you know, all of these things where people were like, now is the time. And Jason, when we talked about Better Luck Tomorrow, that was Jason. Like, yes, exactly. That's exactly. Yeah, yeah. That was, like, was a big one. Oh my one. gosh, that was a that big was one. a big one. That was yeah. a big one. And we thought um, this is the turn, and then nothing. Yeah, <laughs> and you know that even like um, in smaller ways, even things like Lost and okay. having yeah. Daniel Day Kim's character, yes. you know, this Korean, you know, national, etc. And I remember receiving, um, you know, hearing about hearing about that and and of course being of asian descent it it's something you pay more attention to you, it probably sticks out more to you so it maybe that was a different kind of conversation maybe not quite the the highly visible highly public yes, sort of yes. thing that uh, everything everywhere all at once is but there's enough there for me to kind of go let's see where we are in five years okay um okay. and let's see how it progresses because some of it you could also you know some of it you could also uh chalk up to the idea that there's a lot of content in general mm -hmm. right that there's okay. maybe more access more variety more streaming networks and that what we're seeing is um a result of the increasing number of niches that are being addressed right so what do we mean by success in this field is becomes a more dominant question and a different question than it was before, because before it would have meant there are three television networks and there's X number of shows in prime time. They are 22 episodes a year, you know? So if you're not involved in them, is, is your visibility at a certain level? If you're not a main character in them, is your visibility at a certain level? Right? So, mm -hmm. So it's a scale. A lot is to scale. The scale, may, yeah. the scale matters. Yeah, hundred um, percent. And I think that it's why it's uh, important to us. I think. I think is that let's pick a metric, right? Let's say what we want to see is proportional growth of people of Asian descent in lead roles. Um, that represents roughly the population of the country. And I'm speaking about Asian American, which is distinct from people from Asia, Correct. which is a different yes. conversation. Yeah, different conversation. Yeah. So I don't know what those numbers are, but I doubt they're at parity, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and, you know, once you start looking at how are we actually, what are we actually using to sort of identify what we mean by growth? Mm -hmm. then I think we have a more valid conversation. It yeah. doesn't mean, uh, it doesn't mean none of these things are important. They're hugely important. You know, they're, they're largely important because, um, I've been thinking about this a lot. I've mentioned it in a couple of places, but the, the familiarity effect where once you see something happen because you've seen it happen, this is one aspect of it. There are a couple of versions of it, but, uh, aspects to it, I mean, but once you've seen something happen, now, you know, it's possible. 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. And then, so sometimes you see that where it's like, uh, like in athletics, for example, where it's like someone breaks a time on a race and then suddenly a bunch of people can do it. There's something about mm -hmm. human nature where we have to understand that it's possible before it becomes possible. And so the significance of things breaking through certain barriers or, or acquiring a certain level of recognition that feeds into that idea of, um, oh, this is all possible. This is all the way it can be. The thing that was most significant to me about beef, for example, okay. was that this was an Asian American story. Mm -hmm. Almost the entire cast is Asian American. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And quite specific in certain levels too, right? There's a lot of Korean Americans, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was great. But what resonated the most for me is that we didn't, no one really talked about it. It's not really, a, it doesn't really matter in the world. It's not something that is a feature. And that's one of those things that really makes the lens shift. Now there is obviously, you know, there are characters who are, who are white, who see the world. And when we're with those characters, you're, you're aware of the shifting of the lens much more explicitly. But when you're just living with of the other characters in the cast. It doesn't matter. And we're not talking about it. And so we're just looking at a story of people in specific situations with specific problems, with specific desires, et cetera, just like every piece of storytelling actually is, right? Um, and that the, the, the fact of their ethnic background does not take center stage, mm -hmm. you know? And that's the biggest fight I've encountered uh, coming up as an Asian American actor in the era that I came up with is that everyone wants that to be the most important thing they look at. Um, and when it's that dominant in the, in the frame, it eclipses everything else. Mm -hmm. And, and it's so vague as to be meaningless. The idea <laughs> that, right. It's the idea that I'm Korean American, that's not a trait. That's not like a character description. Right. Right. You know, it's, it's just an aspect. It's immutable. Mm -hmm. And does it help me inform certain kinds of stories? Probably, but just in the way that as an actor, I can draw off of a history. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I'm not brought in, or for a long time, at least, I wasn't brought in to be like, hey, there's a guy that plays these kinds of characters well. Mm -hmm. The first thing they're asking is, what's his ethnic background? Is that in the breakdown? And what is his, you know, maybe his age? Yeah. Something like that. Right. Yeah. And you're like, wow, you know, that's, that's not taking into account uh, all these other aspects of a person's humanity. Mm -hmm. Right. And aren't, isn't that what we're supposed to be talking about? Isn't that what a character is supposed to be built around? You know? Um, so I, I reserve my, my enthusiasm is, is there. But I, I do have a his like I do have a memory of of course you know the echoes of these things um, yeah when you've been in the industry and and been working and stuck with it because of someone who didn't stick with it because of because I was like oh I'm not wanted here <laughs> <laughs> I'm wanted elsewhere and can do things elsewhere I feel like my energy would be better you know like well you're not in L A though right you're not living in L A like now you don't no have not to, right now you yeah. know now you don't have to at the time you were there, you didn't have any, you know, chance, you know, kind of thing. And well, so that, you that, know, you that sound touch, didn't take to me. Well, you, you actually touch upon something important in that comment, which is um, much in the way that, you know, an ethnic identity can sort of subsume all other aspects of an identity as an actor. The profession of acting can subsume all these other aspects of your life. And when people go, oh, you have to live in LA, you have to live in New York. What they really mean is, certain things will be easier in those cities, potentially exponentially easier. And if you're at a place in your career where um, there's already a lot of friction because there's far too much supply to the demand, whatever it might be, then um, that's one way you can ease that friction is giving yourself the advantage of proximity. Mm -hmm. But if that makes the rest of your life a problem, I think you have to ask whether it's worth it. Yeah. You know, um, 
I don't know that many people, if I'm honest, where I feel like, oh, if they weren't acting, there was nothing else for them. You know? Yeah. It's, it would be as absurd as anyone pointing to any profession and saying, that's the only thing that person can do. Right. Right. I don't think that that is a healthy attitude. Mm -hmm. um, and there's even something more insidious about acting where people love it. They love it. It's a passion. And it's very difficult to exercise that passion outside of the profession. I think that's super dangerous because every other passion most people have, you can do that and no one looks at you funny. Mm. Um, but for some reason, if you decide, oh, I'm going to act, but only, you know, as a hobby, people go, I don't even know how you do that. Part of that is because of the, the construct. Like you, it really, in many ways, acting requires an audience. It requires collaboration. It requires these things. Um, it's a highly integrated sort of activity, but it's not like you can't do it. You could get a group of friends together and read plays. It doesn't have to go beyond that. And you would right. be exercising all of these things. But we see that as weird. And we see that as a, almost frivolous, or we see it as... The only part that makes sense to most people is if you're trying to become a professional actor. Right, right, right. Right. And so that profession of acting suddenly dominates your, the landscape of your life. And you're moving to cities because of it, and you're changing all of your nutrition because of it, and you're, you know, you're changing your, the way you look because of it, the way you dress because of it, the way you engage on social media because of it. Because of it. You're trying to change everything who you are to, to chase an imaginary idea of what you think some completely anonymous group of people might want, right? And it's like, that's a tough way to live. Yeah. That's a really tough way to live. And you can rob yourself of many years doing that, you know? So I think it's, um, I think it's important for people to see acting as a part of their life, but not their life, you know? Wow. Yeah. That's and really and well, I think well. especially as young, act young actors, I think fall into that trap a lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Yes, and there's a romance resonated. to it. Sorry. <laughs> no, go ahead. No, I was going to say something resonated with me last time that we spoke because you, you know, you there was some banter on Twitter about one thing and you're like, you know, people think of my profession and they think it's one thing when it's not, right? Like they, mm -hmm. they there's such yeah. a misconception of what what it is you do or who you are and that and and you you articulate things so eloquently so i'm very glad at least for this part last part of the interview that i got to just sit and listen to you explain <laughs> things so wonderfully because yeah i'm like oh man now i'm going to be thinking about that thing hoon lee said again <laughs> for like weeks and weeks and weeks you know which is why langley said you know hoon lee for president uh, <laughs> you just like put you string together the thoughts so well ah, and... he's from south africa he doesn't know what he's talking about <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh i really enjoyed um you know sharing on all these conversations and then just like stringing it together where like you all know each other and then you know um it's it's been so much fun and such a privilege but uh, just before we wrap up back to the writer um aspect because you know you mm. kind of like you said kind of got this foray into it now and are you going to be continuing that journey yeah is that something yeah. that you're going to be um looking to do in other um avenues where it's like it's you know for yourself or for other productions and yeah, um now you you do a lot of conversation with uh is it greg rucka is that right yes yeah okay so a lot. the comic book world the comic yeah. book world right but he's also I, writing like the old guard and you know that's he right writes, that's right he's a he's a he, yeah he does screenplays too now so i think that i i would be shocked if you found someone who's seen as like a comic book writer who didn't at least begin as an artist mm. or or vice versa right like those disciplines are married and the thing people who love the form they aren't separated until you get to the professional stage, mm. right? And there are plenty of examples of people who never separate them, right? Particularly in the indie world, I would say. You get more yeah. writer, draw, artist. You do it all, yeah. Cartoonists, right? Or, or comic artists. Comic, yeah, yes. Yeah, but uh, I, think, um, I think actors and writers should see themselves in the same way. That, that what we're doing is telling a story and we're doing it through the... Um, the medium, medium of 
dramatic performance, mm -hmm. but I think there are plenty of actors out there that could write. I think there are plenty of writers out there that should act actually, because the level of intellectual rigor that they can bring to it, um, would potentially lead to a really interesting performance. It, there are barriers to cross to do that. And I, I do think that one, one aspect of that is that writing is such a, it tends to be a fairly internal process and it tends to be in some aspects of it have to be quite solitary. Mm -hmm. Um, but if you're a television writer, for example, you're in constant collaboration with other writers. So I think that's a somewhat self-selecting group. That's a group of people that I think works with other people, um, not just at the writing stage, but in the production stage, especially if they're writer producers. I would say to anyone who is like looking at exploring these things, it's like that, that line, it's use that line. If it's helpful to you, if it helps you organize your tasks. But if you feel this pull one way or the other, you should go for it because I think they are the same thing. They are related things. They are so tightly coupled. Um, and part of the reason why I'm, I've been interested in writing in general is because I feel like it's a creative endeavor that's extremely pure. Like it's almost pure concept. And looking to the future, there's going to be, it would be very, I'd be very fortunate if there isn't a natural constriction of the type of roles that I'm offered or I'm allowed to play based on my age and my type, et cetera, my, my resume. But writing is a place where there's no overhead and you can continue to develop it artistically as long as you can think. Um, so I've, I've wanted to get into it partially to ensure that I have an avenue to develop creatively going forward for the rest of my life. And I've been very um, pleased to recognize all of the ways that it speaks to the things that I already do. Um, and I would say to like, if I were to sit in front of a group of younger actors, I, and I would be like, my actual advice to you would be to start writing immediately. Like get your reps in. At the very worst, what it'll do is it'll help you be a better actor. Yes. At the very worst, at the very yes. least, right? Yeah. And at the most, you may find a path to sort of self-realization creatively that you didn't think was open to you. You know, you can author your own material. You can help collaborate with other people, even in times where you're not being hired as an actor, you can keep your hand in, um, you can create or sell or develop the type of literature and the type of properties and the type of narratives that you would be perfect for people like yourself would be perfect for if you feel you're not working that much it's probably not because you're terrible it's probably because you're underrepresented and people don't quite know what to do with you right well you can help answer that by trying to put some of that stuff into the world that are that is saying this is what you do with me right um will all of those things be successful of course not but that's not the point yeah right yeah. And what you explained too about like actors should just sit around and, and act, right? Like the, why would that be weird? I mean, there's, um, back to my Kung Fu world, I, we have kids and we're, and they're right now, you know, prepping with their performance class and some of them want to be in the lion. Some of them only mm -hmm. want to play the drum. Some of them only mm -hmm. want to do the cymbals. And I'm like, yeah, well, you got to learn all the parts because then you'll be able to do your part better knowing what the lion does if you're just playing the music and right. vice versa and you can't i'm you know make them learn all aspects whether they're going to perform them or not because there's that empathy but also you learn it better so like you said if anything it just makes you better at your craft the chosen one that you're going to like use as your main yeah. source of expression so that makes yeah. a lot of sense i don't think i've ever heard it um as usual per hoon Lee, <laughs> you know way of articulating like put in such a manner of which they do go so hand in hand. And I think it's because it's so intimidating for maybe an actor to go, oh, I'm well, I'm not a writer. Cause I I've been very guilty of saying I'm not a writer. Like like Greg Rucka has actually yelled at me for like saying those sure. words. Like, stop saying that. You're a storyteller though. Like you made a documentary. So you're a storyteller. And it just means here's, you're putting that onto a page. It's it's the same. Here's it's the most obvious medium. example. Here's the most obvious example of this sort of phenomenon. Um, I can't tell you how many times people have told me, um, well, I can't sing. Of course you can sing. What you're talking about is I can't sing in a way that I could make a living from it. Right. Or I can't sing in a way 
that people will compliment me on my singing, mm -hmm. given the current stylistic preferences and fashion of the day. That's what you're actually saying. Because if, if you look at the mass history of successful musicians out there, you have everybody from Celine Dion to Iggy Pop. So what's good singing? Of course you can sing. The question is, does singing bring value into your life? Does singing mean something to you? And my guess is most people, it really would if they allowed themselves. And they're missing out because of some other idea that makes zero sense and doesn't matter. Yeah, if you have an impulse to, yeah, you're a human being. We have voices for a reason, yeah. you know, and it's like we have bodies for a reason. No one would say, well, you shouldn't exercise because you're not great at it. <laughs> well, right? I mean, to be fair, this is coming from someone who sings well. <laughs> it's the same thought. I don't exercise no, particularly you're right. well. Yeah, you're you know? right. You're right. I'm teasing. But you. it's like, why should you? Like, well, I can't dance. Of course, you can dance. Yes. Of course, yes. you can dance. Yes. No. No. Hundred percent. Those are really. Those are really great analogies. And um, I could probably talk to you all day, but I fear that you won't come back and talk to me again if I keep <laughs> on for like two hours and be like, "Keep going, Hoon Lee. <laughs> share, share. I've got like 10 no. Other we'll, subjects. Fi we'll find a time, and I'll, I'll, I'll get more information from you about how. Okay. To yeah. We'll do the same. We'll do the. We'll do the eighty twenty split. I, I'm, I'm that comfortable will work. with that. I'm comfortable with that. That works. Uh, before I log off, though, the last time. Um, there was a, a Writers Guild strike. The thing that mm. I remember was Dr. Horrible. Did you ever see that? But, <laughs> Dr. Um, Horrible. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so in my, oh my mind, God. I was like, oh, maybe people, maybe they'll start doing uh, those productions. Um, real quick, do you have any comments since it's so fresh? The, the strike um, is really strike. interesting uh, in the sense that okay, it's, it's going to be a problem for everyone. Um, I hope it is over quick. Yeah. Uh, but I will say... As my first year in the WGA, I was paying attention to it for once. And like, um, welcome <laughs> a little bit. Uh, <laughs> that's fine, you know. Um, but I do feel like the issues at hand are incredibly important. Yeah. And um, things like the streaming services and how writers make a living. Um, I think the guild is is exactly on the right side of this. I can't evaluate, um, I can't do all the math on the percentages and stuff. Like, I, I don't know course, what's considered yeah. greedy. Mm -hmm. it, like that's what the producers, guild, uh, producers union is going to bring back to the table is sort of saying, we're cutting costs, blah, blah, blah. And then the writer's guild will hold up these, you know, triple digit million salaries that the CEOs are getting. Right. Everyone has a point, but. Uh, from what I've seen in terms of what was offered by the Guild and how the producers responded, the there's a lot of distance and some of those things. One of them, I believe, I, I echoed in an Instagram story, which was about the Guild wanting to regulate and restrict the use of artificial intelligence. The fact that it was almost a completely flat rejection from the producers, I think, is a it's a it's a big misstep in my mind because. That technology changes so quickly. This, the um, contracts are going to be re renegotiated again in several years. Yeah. They could have taken the opportunity to say, we value your human voice. We value your lived experience. And this is a real easy way for us to show that, is to say, yes, of course, there should be some regulation on these tools because we're an industry of people telling stories about people to people. Yeah. They could have said something along those lines. And I think it, the optics would have been much better. Instead, how it comes across to me is if we could replace you, we would. If yeah. we could replace you with machines and software, we absolutely would in order to increase our profits. And to me, that's a, that was a missed opportunity. Um, and obviously there's a lot of nuance to the conversation. Maybe there's large things I'm missing, um, but I can tell you how it will be perceived. And I think that's how it will be perceived. Oh, it did 100%. lead me to have a really interesting conversation with ChatGPT though. Oh, <laughs> uh, I have done the same. What does it say about yeah. you, Hoon Lee? <laughs> oh no, I asked ChatGPT. I, I asked them, I, I started asking about them the questions about guilt. why should producers should or should not use artificial yeah. intelligence. Yeah. I think ChatGPT had a very balanced and 
an actually fairly nuanced response to all that. Mm-hmm. So that was good. Yeah, it's a little scary to be honest. <laughs> Cause you know, you're kind of like playing with this this new new toy tool, but I'm like, okay, the Cylons are coming. Like that's it. I'm, no, I'm, no, 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 no. You know I'm what like, it's like? I'm like, oh my God. No, you know what it's like, Mimi? Do you have a friend that reads a lot? Mm-hmm. Like reads my a husband. ton. <laughs> right. Yeah. And is like and and is pretty quick, right? Pretty sharp. Mm-hmm. So they can take, they can assimilate all this information and then they can pull it, integrate it into their yes. own current thoughts and credences, and then they can articulate them to you. That's what ChatGPT yeah. is doing. It's just doing it super fast. Yes, right? it's doing it super fast because it's pulling all the in- info. But yeah. yeah, it's it's fascinating though. It is fascinating. It's yeah. fascinating. It's very, very fascinating. It's, fascinating. it's the beginning. It's, it's, I know, I know we're not at the Cylons yet, but it's, <laughs> to me, I'm going Ooh, here we go. Because I've had a also, I know I got to let you go. I've had interesting conversations with artists, right? About yeah, about the AI and 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 you know, because they're one of my my kids like messed around did these really cool images of me. I'm like, oh yeah, make me look 30 years younger. Love that. And you know, like oh my <laughs> gosh, and like a warrior person, and it just it's fascinating. But you know, the the creatives that side of things, and like you said, the human side of things. It's it's still I feel like we're a long way from being replaceable, right? It's but the 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 mother problem, or the mother thing that we wrestle with at the end of the day, I think more and more I'm just thinking this is just it's just the the constant and relentless pursuit of increased profit. Yep. Like that's what's really killing us. Yeah, because if you 100%. think about. You think about artistic AI, why is this important as a problem? It's because, well, at least some aspect of it is because what we put value on is a product that can be sold Mm -hmm. or a type of product or production capacity of an artist that needs to be protected so that they can make a living from their art. Now, on the other hand, if what we valued in art was process, right, Mm -hmm. then uh, the result would matter less. The fact that a computer did it, we wouldn't value it as much as the fact that the human did it. Mm-hmm. We would see the value in the human hand and the human process. And we'd say, look at this painting. But what's more important is why, why I decided to acquire it is because every time I look at this painting, my understanding of the journey to that painting is meaningful to me. Yeah. Right. And we don't put emphasis on that. So we put emphasis on, can I get a result as quickly as possible so I can minimize my invested time and maximize my return on the sale of that product? It's like, so on some level, I'm not worried about it Mm -hmm. because I, I think if we address the larger question, some of the other stuff will start to have the volume turned down a little bit. Um, And I think we need to address the larger question. It's just yeah. feeding into so many of our problems. Um, yeah, I, I like that you, although have all these really like in-depth thoughts on things, you do re- tend to remain hopeful. Because as you said, I, I talk to Greg Rock all the time and he's like <laughs> apocalyptic. He real pessimistic? You know, on the, uh, yeah, it's like, no, no, <laughs> greed, is, greed is the reason for all things. And, and he's constantly proving it true every time we have a conversation on whatever it may be. You know, and he also did novels where it was like, you know, whatever it was, sex trafficking, all these really crazy things. And at the bottom line, it's like, oh, not because they're enslaving people, it's because there's a profit to be made, right? Like anything evil is usually driven by greed and money and and, and all of that. And so well, it's, uh, it's okay, scary so... when that's a motivator. <laughs> Here, here's the thing though, here's the thing. Like, I don't know about the causality of it. I mean, I'm not saying I disagree. I'm saying I don't know. Right, right, right. Of it, right. We've, you know, people who have experienced racism firsthand, yeah, it doesn't seem tied to a profit motive. Right, right, right. Right. And it, could you track it to a profit? Well, maybe. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But in, you know, there's enough, uh, there's enough obscurity there for me to question that. So okay. is it that uh, we develop systems of racism just to serve our greed? Or is it that we used, uh, we tried to find a way to leverage our racism? Right. 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 More both, maybe both, you know, depending on where you are, who you are. That sort of yeah. thing. Um, so I, but I look at it like, well, if, if greed exists on one end of the spectrum, on the other end of the spectrum is something like, um, I don't know, I'm going to get this wrong, like sacrifice, maybe let's call it sacrifice. Okay. Right. And I say, there's plenty of examples of that floating around too. We just think of it as commonplace. And so unless someone don't donates a hundred million dollars to some charity, 
we don't take note of it, but any mother sacrifices for their child. And it's so pedestrian, we don't think about it. We expect it. And that gives me hope because I'm, that's part of our nature too, right? And, and it's don't have to look far to see it. And so I feel like maybe we're giving that short shrift and maybe the real problem is that we don't know how to exercise it and we do know how to exercise this other thing. We've built systems to help it become easier. We haven't created systems that reduce the friction on this other impulse that we have to help exercise that and to help build that capacity up. So it might be more of an imbalance than a plague. Um, but it might be a plague. <laughs> <laughs> might be a plague. I love it. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> After all of that, you're like, but it also. Well, I, but that's why I remain optimistic. I see plenty of yeah. good happening. Um, yeah. It tends to be more low key, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah. No, yeah. I, I, I appreciate that. And um, I am going to be very uh, um, mindful of your time here. So I am definitely, though, writing off like where we left off, because I think we sure. have a lot more down the rabbit hole to go. I'm going to have to like get you in on a regular schedule, I think, you know, <laughs> as, as as another co-host of this show. I'm like, this show no longer yeah. belongs to me. It's just like, let's just let's just keep this cycle going. And I'm um, in all serious, though, I've, I've always gotten amazing commentary on how much people enjoy uh listening to you speak oh, that's kind. conversation and and just like your thoughts on things and not just thank on you. acting and everything but yeah I, I really appreciate these conversations i always learn so much and um thank you also for your interest today and just being so supportive it's <laughs> awesome it is really awesome i hope you take a well-deserved break and thank you treat yourself in some way but <laughs> you're, <will> <laughs> you're you're literally impacting generations and not many people can say that Thank you so much. I really appreciate that, especially coming from you. So until next time, Hoon Lee. All right. Take care. Bye. That's all for today's episode. Thanks for listening to the Sifu Mimi Chan Show. Please subscribe and rate my podcast on your platform of choice and leave a review. You can become a patron of the show at patreon.com slash Sifu Mimi Chan to help keep this podcast going. Follow me and interact on social media at Sifu Mimi Chan on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook.